This week's blog post is Favorite Recommendations of 2023, Part 2, Covering Painting and Sculpture. In 2023, I emailed 215 art-related items to supporters of my Sunday recommendations list. This week, I'm giving you my favorites in painting and sculpture. In painting, I had five top picks. These are not in any particular order. But the first that I'm talking about is Domenico Ghirlandao's Portrait of Giovanna Tornabuoni, circa 1489 to 1490. It's a lovely and evocative Renaissance portrait. Italian artists of this period were looking to Roman models, and profile portraits on coins were among the few surviving Roman artifacts. No Roman paintings were available as illustrations of color or shading or light, so we can see how much progress Renaissance painters had made all on their own. See Innovators in Painting, Chapter 16 and following. Even more importantly, though, this painting shows how much views of man and life on earth have changed since the Middle Ages. Lorenzo Tornabuoni, a prominent Florentine banker, commissioned this portrait after his beautiful young wife died in childbirth. Giovanna is represented as she was when alive. Pious, her prayer book is behind her, but with elaborately dressed hair, expensive clothes, and bejeweled accessories. The words on the Trump Lion note behind her on the right are adapted from the Roman poet Marshall, who died around 102 AD. In translation, they say, Art, would that you could represent character and mind. There would be no more beautiful painting on earth. Domenico Ghirlandao didn't have the innovative genius of his contemporaries Leonardo and Raphael. He did, however, run the largest painting workshop in Florence and it was to that workshop that 13-year-old Michelangelo was sent to learn to paint. Michelangelo was probably there when Ghirlandao was painting this portrait. Next up, Alexander Harrison, The Amateurs, 1882-83. A charming work exhibited at the 1893 Columbian Exposition, now at the Brouwer Museum of Art, Valparaiso University, Valparaiso, Indiana. I love the way the light hits the water, and I am waiting breathlessly to see if these two are going to capsize the boat. I spoke about this and other paintings displayed at the Columbian Exposition in one of the sessions of the Resurrecting Romanticism Conference in October 2023. If you look at the books and essays page on dianedurantywriter.com, you can see if the video of that talk is available yet. third of my top picks for painting, Raphael's Baldassare Castiglione, circa 1514 to 1515. Raphael made two major contributions to the progress of painting, see Innovators in Painting, chapters 23 and 24, and he was also an extremely competent portrait painter. His portrait of Castiglione was enormously influential. Copies exist by Rembrandt, Rubens, and Matisse, among others. Castiglione, a diplomat, humanist, and longtime friend of Raphael, was the author of Il Cortigiano, 1528, an etiquette book that instructed courtiers and would be courtiers on the manners, physique, courage, education, and dress expected in high class circles. Il Cortigiano was translated to six languages during the 1500s and was one of the most widely read books of that century. The book popularized the term sprezzatura, an effortless grace that befits a man of culture. As Castiglione put it, quote, a certain nonchalance so as to conceal all art and make whatever one does or says appear to be without effort and almost without any thought about it. End of quote. Cyrano de Bergerac, James Bond, Percival Blakeney, and Roger Federer have sprezzatura. So does Robinson's Flamande. That's a poem you can look up. Fourth, Titian, Bacchus and Ariadne, 1522 to 23. For me, this painting isn't about Bacchus and Ariadne, about Greek mythology, or even about love at first sight, which happened to Bacchus in this particular myth. It's about the idea that even when things are at their worst, when your lover has, for example, sailed off on a ship that's now a mere speck on the horizon, the world is 
still shining and beautiful, and the most unexpected delights may be right around the corner. Titian, active circa 1506 to 1576, was one of the most successful painters in 16th century Europe. This and other paintings of his early career show the brilliant, shimmering colors characteristic of the Venetian school, which included Giovanni Bellini, Tintoretto, and Veronese. And the fifth among my top picks, Johannes Vermeer, Woman with a Water Jug, 1660 to 62. This is one of my favorite Vermeers, a world of quiet, glittering peace. Ayn Rand praised Vermeer, whose dates are 1632 to 75, more highly than any other painter. She said, quote, The closer an artist comes to a conceptual method of functioning visually, the greater his work. The greatest of all artists, Vermeer, devoted his paintings to a single theme, light itself. The guiding principle of his compositions is the contextual nature of our perception of light and of color. The physical objects in a Vermeer canvas are chosen and placed in such a way that their combined interrelationships feature, lead to, and make possible the painting's brightest patches of light, sometimes blindingly bright, in a manner which no one has been able to render before or since. That's from Ayn Rand, The Romantic Manifesto, page 48. This painting is a tour de force of light. Look at how it behaves differently when it hits the picture, the window panes, the wall, and the woman's headdress. Woman with the Water Pitcher was the first Vermeer to come to the U.S. It was purchased by Henry Marquand, who commissioned the remarkable piano designed by Sir Lawrence Alma Tadema that I recommended in August of 23. Marquand bequeathed the painting to the Metropolitan Museum. All right, runners up in painting. There are also five, and these are also in no particular order. On the left is Dugald Stuart Walker, illustration for John Maysfield's Sea Fever, 1926. Riffing on the Wanderlust theme, look at the swooping, curving lines of this pen and ink drawing. Can't you feel the movement of the sea? This illustration is from Rainbow Gold, a collection edited by Sarah Teasdale, whose poems, such as Barter, I have often cited in these recommendations. On the right is Maurice Langasquen's the Grenadier André Kuhlmanns, 1917. If you're one of my supporters, you don't need me to point out how crucial art is to survival. But here's an example of a lovely work of art produced when bare survival was difficult. In 1914, the Germans proposed to invade France, not via their shared border, but via Belgium and the Netherlands. Langeskens, 1884 to 1946, joined the Belgian army, and was almost immediately captured and thrown into a prisoner of war camp. He'd been a prisoner for three years by the time he did this portrait of a cellist who was a fellow prisoner of war. The painting is in watercolor, colored pencil, and graphite. I've given you a link to more about art during World War I. Next up, Peter Bruegel the Elder, The Hunters in the Snow, 1565. In the 1560s, Bruegel the Elder painted a series of works representing the seasons. Five of them survive, including this one at the Kunsthistorisches Museum in Vienna and the Harvesters at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, which I recommended back in 2021. Bruegel lived in Antwerp, a major commercial and publishing center in his day, but even a major city wasn't far from the country in the 1500s. I love Bruegel's seasons landscapes because they're full of busy, purposeful people, but the people are always worked into a composition that's based on the sweeping lines of the landscape. For more on that, see my discussion of the harvesters on page 12 of Sunny Sundays. On the right is Fritz Thaulo Kikini, 1899. Just the sight of this river made me feel cool or in the middle of the summer. Thaulo, 1847 to 1906, a Norwegian, did superlative depictions of eddying water. If you look on his Wikipedia page, you can see a number of them. And the last among the runners-up in paintings, Johann Christian Dahl, An Eruption of Vesuvius, 1824. The works of this Norwegian artist remind me of those of his friend Caspar David Friedrich. 
When the ruins of Pompeii were discovered in 1748, Europeans became fascinated with the power of Vesuvius. It was a regular stop on the Grand Tour for noble or wealthy young men. Dahl witnessed an eruption in 1820, and he painted at least seven versions of it. This one, with two elegantly dressed visitors watching the spectacle, is at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Volcanic eruptions were the sort of natural events that Edmund Burke was referring to when he wrote a philosophical inquiry into the origin of our ideas of the sublime and the beautiful in 1757. That work is often credited with starting the Romantic movement, which was in part a reaction to the calm dignity of the neoclassical style. And so we move on to sculpture. There are two works tied for winner. The first is Donatello's St. George, sculpted for Or San Michele, and now in the Borgello Museum in Florence, dates to 1417. Donatello rediscovered many of the major innovations that had been lost since the fall of Rome. For example, he designed sculptures meant to be viewed from all sides. He cast life-size figures in bronze. He created art for the sake of art, not for purely didactic purposes. Donatello's own major innovation was to rethink every subject he chose to sculpt, from the Madonna to St. John the Evangelist, and from Herod's Feast to Mary Magdalene. See Innovators in Sculpture for more discussion of this. For the St. George, Donatello relegated the dragon slaying to a small relief on the base. By doing so, he made the focus of the sculpture not the fight, but St. George's state of mind before he sets out to fight. The frown and the direction of his gaze suggest that he's focused and wary. The tension in the body suggests he's vigilant and ready to move. This is a new type of hero, a thinking man about to become a man of action. 140 years later, Vasari wrote of this sculpture, the St. George. Long quote. Brightness of youthful beauty, generosity, and bravery shine forth in his face. His attitude gives evidence of a proud and terrible impetuosity. The character of the saint is indeed expressed most wonderfully, and life seems to move within that stone. It is certain that in no modern figure has there yet been seen so much animation, nor so lifelike a spirit in marble, as nature and art have combined to produce by the hand of Donato in this sculpture. That's the end of the Vasari quote. And yes, Michelangelo did know this work when he created his David. The second of the winners in the sculpture category, Sir Bernhardt, Self-Portrait as a Chimera, circa 1879. When she was in her late twenties, Sir Bernhardt, 1844 to 1923, was chafing at being cast only in minor roles. As a way to blow off steam, she began learning to sculpt. In 1874, she landed a supporting role in Octave Fayet's The Sphinx. She soon took over the lead role, portraying a woman who commits suicide by using a poison ring in the shape of a sphinx. As a nod to her big break, Bernhardt sculpted this self-portrait as a sphinx or chimera with the body of a griffin, the wings of a bat, and a dragon's tail. I assumed at first glance that she was thinking of herself as a monster, but in fact, she was referring to her ability to transform herself. The clue is that she's put a mask of tragedy on one shoulder, a mask of comedy on the other. Bernhardt wrote, quote, Once the curtain is raised, the actor ceases to belong to himself. He belongs to his character, to his author, to his public. He must do the impossible to identify himself with the first, not to betray the second, and not to disappoint the third. End of quote. This small bronze is not just a self-portrait, but a functional inkwell with a stand for a quill. On tours in America, Australia, and elsewhere, Bernhardt would often have a cast of the inkwell put on display in the theater lobby. I first saw one at the Clark Art Institute in Williamstown, Massachusetts. The Clark has a, an interesting short video about it. There's a link in the blog post. Okay, and the runners-up in sculpture, there are three of these. The first is Jean-Antoine Houdon, a bust of Robert Fulton from 1804. This is a plaster model of one of the last Americans to be sculpted by Houdon, 1741 to 1828. 
who had already created portraits of Washington, Benjamin Franklin, and other founding fathers. When he sat for this portrait, Fulton was in France trying to raise funding for a submarine. The Clermont, his steamboat, was still a few years in the future. Second of three, Pierre Antoine Verschaffelt, Bust of an Englishman, 1740. The good thing, and also the bad thing, about institutions such as the Metropolitan Museum of Art is that they have as many items in storage as on display. After decades of visits, I still often discover artworks that I've never seen before and that are not new acquisitions. As of June 2023, this bust was at the end of a row of Rococo portrait busts in the Petri Court. The modeling of the planes of the face is superb, and the personality intrigues me much more than the other busts that sit nearby. The Schaffelt, a truly international artist, was born in Ghent, modern Belgium, in 1710 and educated in France. He created this bust during a 14-year sojourn in Rome, 1737 to 51, and then spent the remaining 40 years of his life in Mannheim, Germany, as court sculptor to the Elector of the Palatinate. After seeing the Metropolitan Museum's bust, I went looking for more of Verschaffelt's works, but it turns out they're mostly rather mundane, allegorical, and mythological figures for the gardens of the Elector's palaces. So I have to wonder, did Verschaffelt end up in Mannheim because he actually liked doing that sort of work, and he found someone willing to pay him for it, or was he willing to do that sort of work for the sake of having a patron and a reliable income. I don't know. The third and final runner-up in sculpture, Harriet Whitney Frismuth, Christ of the Wave, 1925. This is one of Frismuth's delightful, energetic sculptures. I've given you links to more on her. Small versions of this work come up regularly at auction, so they'll be sold one in early 2022 for $18,900. Next week, we will do favorite recommendations for 2023 in architecture and in museums. Quick summary of what I did in 2023. At the Resurrecting Romanticism Conference in Spartanburg, South Carolina, in October 2023, I gave a talk on romanticism in painting, an hour and a quarter, and another on painting at the 1893 Columbian Exposition in Chicago, half an hour. I also participated in a panel discussion nurturing the new romantics. All of these will eventually be available as videos. When they are, I will put links up on my books and essays page. DianeDurantyWriter.com has hundreds of posts on sculpture, painting, architecture, and my other obsessions. To join the Sunday Recommendations email list, visit the URL that's on the screen or email me. And you can say, well done, Diane, or support my work and receive rewards by means of the tip jar on DianeDurantyWriter.com. As always, thank you for listening.